So hello everyone, I'm a tutor in Earth Sciences here. Uh, and most of my work, I'm a paleontologist and most of my work is on the evolution of reptiles. Um, so I'm going to talk today about what can dinosaurs tell us about evolution. It's actually quite a vague title, uh, but we'll, we'll see what we, what we learn, I guess. Um, there's actually four dinosaurs on the Teddy Hall crest. So those are all four of them, dinosaurs, it turns out. <laughs> and we'll see what that really means. Because dinosaurs, maybe, this is supposed to be funny, they get everywhere. <laughs> At least in this slide, they're everywhere. Um, so if they're everywhere, I guess we should see how many we can spot. So in this picture, in this slide, there's a number of things. Some of them might be dinosaurs and some of them might not be. So what I want you to do is spend a few minutes, maybe not a few minutes, a few seconds, deciding which ones you think are dinosaurs. And then we'll see how many, how many actually were. So I guess the maximum possible number of dinosaurs here is five. Maybe six if you think this turtle is a dinosaur too. Um, and the minimum number is one. I'll tell you there is at least one dinosaur. So, I mean, who, thi who thinks there are five dinosaurs pictured here? Okay, how about four? How about three? Okay, it's a reasonable, reasonable suggestion. How about two? And who thinks there is only one dinosaur here? There's actually only one dinosaur in this picture. Uh, this Tyrannosaurus rex, that's a dinosaur. This obviously is a woolly mammoth, which is a type of mammal, and it's closely related to living elephants. It actually turns out it's more closely related to Asian elephants than to African elephants. Um, this is a Mesozoic marine reptile. That means it's a reptile that lived in the sea at the same time as dinosaurs were around on the land. But actually, this is more closely related to lizards and snakes than it is to dinosaurs. This is a flying reptile called a pterosaur, and pterosaurs are quite closely related to dinosaurs, but they're not really dinosaurs. And this animal is actually more closely related to your grandmother than it is to Tyrannosaurus rex. <laughs> this is one of the earliest uh, evolutionary relatives of mammals. Um, and if you'd met my, dino my, uh, my dinosaur, if you'd met my grandmother, <laughs> <laughs> you'd understand the significance of that comment. Um, so a good question to ask is, what do we actually mean when we say dinosaur? Well, we mean a group of organisms um, that shares a common ancestor in evolutionary terms um, to the exclusion of other groups of animals. So crocodiles aren't dinosaurs for the same reason as this animal, this pliosaurid, isn't a dinosaur. Um, it just happens that they lived around the same time and happened to be extinct. Um, and lots of other things lived at the same time as most dinosaurs. Um, and actually, the fossil record tells us a considerable amount about evolution on land during the time of dinosaurs. And these are some highlights. These are some of my personal favorites. This is the oldest fossil turtle. And that lived about 220 million years ago in China. And it's an interesting turtle. This is it looking at its belly, basically. And it has a well-developed, this is the sort of belly portion of the shell called the plastron. It turns out if you turn it over, there's no shell on the top. So it literally has sort of half a shell just covering its bottom. And it seems to have lived in shallow marine environments, so near the coast in the sea. Uh, and it's an amazing animal. One thing it has that living turtles don't have at all is it has teeth. Um, so it's a kind of half-shelled, toothy turtle. This is a mammal from the time of dinosaurs. This is a kind of classic possum-like mammal that lived around that time. This one, it's kind of hard to see, but what they've tried to show is this is the skeleton, and then they've highlighted something in the middle. This is a sort of dog-sized mammal from about 100 million years ago. And in its stomach area, there are the bones of a dinosaur. So this is a sort of dog-sized mammal that ate baby dinosaurs for lunch. <laughs> um, other animals that went around antagonizing dinosaurs, gigantic crocodiles, essentially. Um, and snakes. This is a large fossil snake, similar to a modern python, that lived in India about 70 million years ago. And its fossils are actually found within the nests of sauropod dinosaurs. So this is a tiny offspring of a dinosaur that, as an adult, could have weighed 40 tons. Um, and it's being antagonized by a snake. We also have older fossil snakes, including marine sort of oceanic snakes that have legs. Um, so they're very early snakes that haven't quite acquired the full set of snake-like features. Um, so clearly, the fossil record from the time of dinosaur provides us with some information about where important modern groups of animals come from. And it turns out dinosaurs are going to be really important in that story. So we'll try to orient ourselves in time now. Um, and the time that we're going to think about primarily is the Mesozoic, uh, from about 250 to 65 million years ago. So that is a time span of nearly 190 million years. So it's an exceptionally long time 
compared to all the time that's gone subsequently, which is just 65 million years. Um, and it's sort of midway in the history of land vertebrates. So we call vertebrates on land the tetrapods. This is one of the earliest tetrapods. It looks a bit like a kind of fishy animal with legs. Um, and that was around about 360 million years ago. And we could go all the way forward to today where humans have constructed complex societies and life is very different to how it was in the past. Um, and we call today broadly the age of mammals. And you can see two different types of mammals here making natural history observations of each other. Yes, the, this one's completed his notes. These ones are still making theirs because they're a bit slow. Um, <laughs> and we could contrast that to this kind of scene we might see during the Mesozoic. We'd see lots of dinosaurs of different shapes and sizes and then other things, examples of which we've seen. Um, and some of those things continue to the present day. Others of them do not. Um, and, you know, we might call this the age of dinosaurs or the age of reptiles. And it seems to have abruptly ended about 65 million years ago when a gigantic meteorite about 10 kilometers across struck the Earth. I like to think about this in terms of the size of Oxford. Uh, so Oxford is a very long and thin city, and it's about five kilometers long. Uh, so this, I think this meteorite was really quite gigantic. Um, and it had catastrophic events for life on Earth. And we tend to think that's the end of it for dinosaurs, but it turns out that birds are dinosaurs. Uh, so the Teddy Hall crest has four dinosaurs on it, for example, uh, which is excellent. Um, so there are some dinosaurs that survive over the boundary and give rise to actually an enormous living diversity of animals. So mammals, uh, there are 5,000 species of mammals on the planet today. There are 10,000 species of birds. So I'd like to kind of rewrite the way we think about the history of animals, it basically comes in two episodes, Age of Dinosaurs 1, followed by Age of Dinosaurs 2, which is where we now live. And these are very ecologically important animals that do an enormous diversity of roles, uh, including living in the poles, so penguins, for example, and living in deserts today. Um, but what do we mean when we say that birds are dinosaurs? I mean, is it just a sort of semantic argument or something we'd like to say to be provocative? Well, actually, it means this is a big evolutionary tree and this is the way we like to think about the evolution of organisms and this includes all dinosaurs that we know of um, and they evolved from a single common ancestor that lived uh, during the Triassic and would be represented right at the bottom of this tree um, and you can see from that ancestor there was a relatively large diversity of different forms that appeared and among those are a actual birds um, and the key point here is that birds aren't you know, some close relative of dinosaurs, and then we think, well, that's nice, let's just call them dinosaurs. They're actually deeply nested within the evolutionary tree of dinosaurs, which means that some dinosaurs are more closely related to birds than others. So these animals, for example, if you follow the lines uh, backwards in time that connect them to birds, you find they share a common ancestor represented by this silhouette that lived after the common ancestor that some other dinosaurs shared with birds. And that's really informative uh, to evolutionary biologists because what it means is if we follow uh, the evo this evolutionary line along here, we're actually able to document uh, the evolutionary appearance of key features of birds that make them successful today. So we can actually see the construction of the bird skeleton and other features of avian biology uh, in the fossil record of dinosaurs. And I think that's very exciting. Um, and one of the most high-profile cases of this is Archaeopteryx. This is a very early bird-like dinosaur from the late Jurassic of Germany, but also a huge swathe of bird-like close, uh, close relatives of birds from among the dinosaurs in China. Um, and this is a nice one. This is something called Microraptor. It lived about 100 million years ago. And you can kind of see it's a small dinosaur, so this animal is about this long, about a foot long or slightly more. And oh, that's its head. This is its long, bony, dinosaur-like tail. These are impressions of feathers on its forearms forming wings. Um, and these are impressions of feathers on its hind limbs forming actually very large surfaces as well. So we think this is a kind of close birdie relative that's a gli small gliding dinosaur, essentially. Um, this is a more distant relative of birds. And this animal uh, is, does not have quill-like feathers like a bird. It has a kind of downy, fluffy, fur-like covering. And that's more distantly related to birds, and it seems what happened is uh, the origin of feathers through evolution proceeded through a kind of fur-like step, which is insulating the animal. It doesn't make sense to insulate an animal or a building, for example, unless you have central heating. So I think this is fairly compelling evidence that dinosaurs were generating at least some heat internally. Heat is very metabolically expensive to produce, so it's worth insulating your body 
uh, if you're essentially warm-blooded. Um, this, this is a head, this is a tail, that's a leg and an arm. This is a dinosaur, I don't think it's remarked upon very often, but it's quite a chicken-like dinosaur. It's not closely related to chickens at all. Um, it's less closely related to birds than some of the other things pictured here. But what it has in common with chickens is it has a toothless skull and it has a ball of gravel uh, in its stomach. And chickens swallow a lot of gravel today and use that to process food that they eat in their stomachs. So these are really important animals in telling us something about the ecological diversity of animals on the line leading to birds and where bird-like features come from. I guess one of the things we're always really interested in with respect to dinosaurs is size. Uh, and this is something I did some work on recently, and I find quite interesting. These are mammals, some mammals today. This is a very big mammal. This is a very small mammal. Uh, and they're sort of enjoying some discourse, as all mammals do, among each other. And actually, it turns out that this mammal, the very small one, is in the vast majority. So this is a pie chart, and what you've got here is we've put rodents. Uh, they're the blue slice of mammal diversity. And bats, they're the red slice, and then all other mammals are taken up, all other mammal species are taken up by this yellow uh, portion. And basically what you can see is there's about 4,000 species of mammals today, four to 5,000, and at least three quarters of them are small mammals. You know, all bats, what's that? Oh. Okay. But yeah, but I can describe Okay, all no, bats and virtue. We can not have questions anymore. Okay. All bats and virtually all rodents are small, less than a kilogram. Um, so actually most of animal diversity seems to occur at small body sizes. Um, and we're really interested in weighing dinosaurs, basically. That's difficult. Um, it's easy to weigh a living animal, like this elephant. It's difficult to persuade a dinosaur uh, to go on a set of scales. So one thing we do is we try and establish ways to measure the sizes of living animals uh, by measuring portions of their skeletons and establish a statistical relationship. It turns out you can do that by looking at the robustness of their leg bones. And if we do that, we're actually able to measure more than half of known dinosaurs, so about 600 species. And what it seems like is the ancestor of dinosaurs was quite small, weighed about 30 kilos, so about half the mass of a human. Um, and fairly rapidly, dinosaurs attained sizes up to about 80 tons, which is gigantic, and this is a vertebra of a giant dinosaur. Um, also, fairly rapidly, they attain quite small sizes, around to a maximum of about a minimum of about a kilogram, and this is the mass of the earliest bird, Archaeopteryx, um, but it's also the mass of some other small dinosaurs. So multiple lineages of dinosaurs attain quite small sizes, but they're actually relatively massive compared to most of modern animal diversity. So it seems like this was a real problem for dinosaurs. The only dinosaurs that broke this lower boundary are birds um, in the Cretaceous, and that gave rise to an enormous ecological diversity that continues to the present day, and it may be no coincidence that those are the most successful dinosaurs. So, in summary, what I want to say is when you look at a picture from the time of dinosaurs, you believe maybe the action is all going on among these big, lumbering, and somewhat tedious beasts, but actually, in terms of establishing the future of biodiversity, it's really these tiny and overlooked dinosaurs, the birds, um, where all the action is actually going on. Uh, and that is it. Thank you very much.